Really glad everyone could join us today. Glad you're here. Glad you're able to watch from home or wherever you're at. Um, wanted to just say this because some have been concerned. Uh, you know, I'm, I've been fairly isolated here speaking uh, to you online. It's different than having you with me. Uh, I am not, however, alone. Just a reminder uh, that I have some, some friends here. And over the past few weeks, uh, really especially Travis and Sue here in the front, I've gotten to know them very well. Uh, they've gotten me through a lot of tough things. I would just say this. If you knew them like I knew them, there isn't anything you wouldn't do for them. I, I never actually saw uh, Castaway, but I think I've fallen into that, that category. Uh, they are my Wilson, so to speak. So it's working out. I'm not totally alone. I want to do this today. We're going to conclude our series on revival. That doesn't end our, our desire for revival. It doesn't end our passion for revival. Uh, it's just as far as our series goes, is a good place to kind of put a, a conclusion on it. And so we're going to talk about lighting the fire today. And, uh, and, and I just thought I would start with this idea that there are a lot of warnings you read in life that are just kind of silly. Uh, I, I know, just having grown up where you cut down a lot of trees, that having to put a warning out that say, be careful not to hold the wrong end of a chainsaw is, is a pretty silly warning. You should know that. And at least it's a mistake you're not going to make more than twice. Uh, the other one I saw up here that I thought was interesting was touching wires causes instant death. But not only do you die, you've got to pay a $200 fine. I don't know how they're going to collect that, but that's silly to me. Uh, another warning sign up here is that you shouldn't hang signs on fence. Of course, they hung it on the fence. Have they not heard of yard signs is all I'm asking. Uh, another one I read, road ends in water. Uh, that's just maybe a don't always trust your GPS kind of a thing. If the road becomes water, don't drive. And the last one I had up there, like you have to make this sign, is roads are unsafe when underwater. Yes, I would think so most of the time. All right, so here's the point. Though some warnings we read are silly, there are warnings that can save your life. And one of them I remember hearing all the time growing up, it might have been that there was a touch of pyro in me, was that you shouldn't play with fire or else you could get burnt. Now, that's just a great warning. And there are all kinds of ways in which it's unwise to mess around or play around with fire. But having said that, I find it interesting that God would use fire as a picture of his own presence. Uh, think about this. There's this one of the symbols for the presence of God is fire. And so alone in the desert, Moses is drawn to this presence of God in a burning bush on Sinai. The Hebrews were confronted with the presence of God and were told the mountain was filled or consumed with fire. As Solomon dedicated the temple, the glory of the Lord, it says, comes down and fire fell from heaven. Daniel was entranced by the Ancient of Days, and it says he saw on the throne one of fire and a river of fire flowing from it. And when Ezekiel looked into heaven, he saw something similar. He said a throne and someone full of fire sat upon it. And there was purpose behind God telling the priests of Israel, never let the fire in the temple go out. It must burn continually. And just as purposeful is the, the saying of John the Baptist that I baptize in water, but there is one coming after me who is mightier than I, and he will baptize you in the Holy Spirit and with fire. Think about it. Even the words of Jesus in Luke 12 at verse 49. I come to set fire to this world and I wish it were already burning. Now, maybe that idea is so often connected to the image of God and the presence of God. This idea of fire is why that throughout history, revival also has always been connected with fire. So what is revival fire? What exactly are we talking about? Like when we sing songs like light the fire or we say of someone uh, that they're just on fire for God or notice that someone has lit a fire in them. Well, to pray revival or for revival is to pray for fire from heaven to break through our lives and fill us and drive us toward God. You know, there's perhaps no one in the Bible who knew how to get the fire started better than the prophet Elijah. And so I want you to turn in your Bibles, and we'll be doing most of our reading through 1 Kings chapter 16 and then 18 later on. And so if you just have your Bibles open and ready, we'll do a lot of reading from 1 Kings 16 and then later chapter 18 as well. 
So last week we saw what Samuel did in leading Israel toward revival. Today, I want to study one final revival in our series, which happens to be the only revival that ever came to the northern kingdom. You see, those ten tribes that seceded from uh, the other southern tribes, two of them, uh, had 19 kings in their history. And, And you can read in Scripture that not one of them was good. And interestingly enough, Israel's greatest revival is going to take place during the reign of her most wicked king. And so 1 Kings, starting out chapter 16 at verse 29. It says, Now Ahab, the son of Omri, became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah. And Ahab, the son of Omri, reigned over Israel in Samaria 22 years. Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians, and went to serve Baal and worship him. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. You can continue to read about Ahab and find out that that he's a man really particularly had no strong convictions as far as religion was concerned. But he married a woman who did. Very strong convictions. In fact, Jezebel, what she really wanted was for Baal worship to become the state religion of Israel. Just consider that for a minute. Now, there are two ways that you could make something like that happen. And the first was through government-sponsored or supported false prophets. You see, this woman Jezebel actually had 850 false prophets who ate at her table with her. She supported them. Uh, She cared for them. The second way to do this would be to systematically eliminate all the prophets of God. You see, many righteous men of God were executed by Jezebel. In fact, Obadiah, a servant of Ahab, actually rounded up a hundred faithful prophets still alive and hid them in two caves and cared for them by keeping them out of Jezebel's reach. So Ahab was a committed leader. He was just committed to all the wrong things. Uh, His emphasis was all wrong. Or maybe we should say committed to the wrong person. 1 Kings 21, 25 says, There was no one like Ahab who had chosen so often to do what the Lord said was wrong because his wife Jezebel influenced him to do evil. And this is just yet another dark moment in Israel's history. But in the midst of total darkness, a fire from heaven is about to set the palace of the king ablaze. And so look at chapter 17 at verse 1. It says, Now Elijah the Tishbite, From Gilead said to Ahab, as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, whom I serve, there will be neither dew nor rain in the next few years except by my word. Elijah comes into the palace of the king and says, my God is Yahweh. My God is Jehovah. And he announces to the king who has been killing God's prophets. He says, I'm here to give you a weather report. See, because of what you've done and because of who you are and whom you serve, it's going to get dry around here for more than three years. Now, Elijah standing by was not going to let Israel think that God was some kind of a weak deity that had just stepped aside and given his throne to Baal. And Baal was the chief fertility god of the Canaanites. He He was the God they worshiped for bringing sun and bringing rain, for making the produce and the crops available to them. He was the God they believed provided for them and cared for them. And Elijah's bold forecast was a slap in the face of Ahab's adopted religion. And having announced it, Elijah quickly became the most wanted man in Israel. And so for the next three years, he goes into hiding. And Ahab didn't just let that lie. He actually sent men, even into other countries, to look for this prophet. And so the priests of Baal, while Elijah wasn't present, started spreading rumors about the people, uh, about Elijah to the people, misleading them, and saying, Elijah's the one that caused this trouble. Elijah's the reason we're going through this drought. He's the reason for this famine. And after three and a half years pass of drought and famine, of dryness, God tells Elijah, I want you to go back to Ahab. 
And in chapter 18, at verse 16, Elijah actually asks Obadiah to set up a meeting with the king. And Ahab met with Elijah. And the very first words out of Ahab's mouth are, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? See, that was the rumor that had been circulating about Elijah. And let me tell you, starting a revival fire will not make you popular. It won't make you a welcome visitor. In fact, as a preacher, I read a guy like Elijah. He challenges me. Like what he was willing to say, the commitment he was willing to make, and the challenges he was willing to face, that challenges me. Am I really that committed to revival for this church? Am I willing to endure what Elijah endured to start what Elijah started? And I'll just tell you, I would love to have Elijah's accomplishments, but I don't want his banishment. I would, I would love to have his results, but I don't want all the reproach. And, and, and that's just the truth of Christianity, isn't it? Are we willing to take and endure the suffering for the glory that comes to God? Let me tell you, every person, for every person that wants to start a fire, you're going to find another who's ready to pour water on it. That's just the way life works. You get excited about it. You get ready to go. Someone's ready to put it out. And I want to be clear. If revival is going to come, it's going to have to come in spite of all those who want to drown it out. It's going to take somebody like an Elijah who's determined to bear the mocking, the scoffing, the criticism, the ridicule, and through all the difficulty, just commit to starting a fire anyway. And it's hard to start a revival fire. In fact, I, I see three real challenges to it, and that'll be the outline of our study this morning. And I'll start with this one. It's going to take some powerful praying. See, first, it took some courage after three and a half years, knowing he was the most wanted man in Israel, for Elijah to show back up in front of Ahab. But he did. And really, what, what he's facing now is this original confrontation of, you let Baal grow crops without rain. You see, you let your little G God overcome this challenge, and, 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 and then we'll see what happens. And now all this time has passed, and it hasn't worked out for them. Now I would just say this, for all of us who've been in our homes more than we're used to, many weeks now it's been, I want you to listen to this. What did Elijah do with his three years off? Well, we're told. The Bible tells us he prayed. He actually spent those years praying that it would not rain in Israel. Just let that sink in. How did he come up with that prayer? How did he come up with that desire, that passion, that purpose for three years? Well, there's a passage in Deuteronomy chapter 11. And in verse 16, it says, Be careful, or you will be enticed to turn away and worship other gods and bow down to them. And then the Lord's anger will burn against you. And he will... Shut the heavens so that it will not rain and the ground will yield no produce and you will, you will soon perish from the good land the Lord has given you. Now, this is where he got the idea. See, Elijah knew this was a promise from the word of God. He knew that he could claim that promise every day in prayer and that his prayer would be effective. But I want you to understand something. That was a difficult prayer for Elijah to pray. In fact, I imagine it hurt him every day to ask that of God. Just think about it. He was praying for drought. He was asking for famine. And he knows that that's going to bring devastation to the people he loves the most on the face of this earth. He's asking for hardships and difficulties. And suffering to come down on God's people. And Elijah had the courage to pray this way because he knew the best way to end a spiritual famine was to ask for a physical famine in Israel. You know, one thing we know about revival is that it calls us to get serious about our prayers. I mean, to really dig in with our prayer life. And Elijah's prayer is both terrible and necessary. You see, when sin plagues us, it has to be wiped out. And revival fire will break out when we are so vexed and upset about our rebellion against God. This is when we pray hard. That's when we pray powerful prayers. 
And these difficult prayers are what drives people back to God. Let me just ask, have we ever wanted revival that bad? Have we let our sin and our rebellion against God bother us so bad spiritually that we find ourselves praying prayers that we never thought we would utter before? I can think of times, not just once, but where a man had decided he was going to leave his family. Just leave it all behind. Quit on the whole thing. It was too much for him. And having known him, I just, I just remember dropping to my knees and begging God, please stop him. Humble him. Make him aware of what he's about to sacrifice. God, wake him up, whatever it takes. Bring him to a place of repentance. See, that's praying difficult prayers. Powerful prayers. And revival will never come as long as physical famine bothers us more than spiritual famine. We must pray these powerful prayers that are based on the promises in God's word. You see, God delighted in Elijah's prayer, even though it was difficult. God answered him. And the truth is, God will answer us. And I know this because God promises this in his word. James, the brother of Jesus, writes, Elijah was a man just like us. I love that. I'm so thankful that's in the scripture. Because we love to look at those who lead great revivals, those who do great things in scripture, and say, well, if we were only men like them. Elijah was a man just like us. And he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And it did not rain on our land for three and a half years. And so the challenge here is not, can we pray like Elijah? The challenge is, will we pray powerful prayers like Elijah? Well, here's the second challenge to revival fire, and that is, it's going to take some pointed preaching. Understand that three years of drought did not make Elijah popular when he shows his face back up in Israel. But the nation's disinterest in listening was not going to dim his eagerness to speak. And so I'm going to continue our story in chapter 18 of 1 Kings. And at verse 18 it reads, I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet on Mount Carmel and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. And Elijah went before the people and said, How long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. And then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. Get two bulls for us. Let them choose one for themselves and let them cut him into pieces and put it on the wood, uh, uh, but not set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people said, what you say is good. I want us to notice something very quickly about the difference between Elijah and Obadiah. And, and I just want to be very clear about this. I've got no real problems with Obadiah. He is a great man. He was a devout man. He was a faithful man. He saved the lives of hundreds of people. But the diplomacy of Obadiah never started a revival. Revival does not start until someone steps up and demands that a decision be made. And this is the problem. Those people will not make up their minds. Who's going to receive their devotion? Which God is it going to be? They won't even choose. And Elijah was a man on the mission of exposing double-mindedness. And so he asks, how long will you waver? How long will you hesitate between two opinions? I'll just give you a, a quick study within the text there that the word Elijah uses for hesitate or waver there in the text is the same word in verse 26 that is translated for the prophets jumping around or literally limping around the altar. And here's the point. The idea here is that there is a dance we do when we don't decide. Now, just notice, when given and called to make a decision, 
The people say nothing. Now you're reading that and you don't know why they don't say nothing, but I do. I know because I'm a preacher and I'll, I'll explain to you why people don't say something when they need to respond. See, they say nothing because that's what people do when they hear something they cannot argue with. They just don't want to hear it. In fact, maybe you've heard this from your kids. You know they've heard you, but you get nothing in response. And so you literally ask, have you heard me? Did you hear me? You see, revival calls for direct preaching that calls people to make a response and doesn't stop until they do. The truth is it makes us uncomfortable. We know it's true. But we don't want to hear it. And when preaching starts to hit really close to home, and that's when people get quiet. That, that, that's when you kind of just don't get any response back. And they don't disagree with it. They just really don't quite want to do it. And preachers who are concerned with being popular stick to telling people how lovely they are. But revival preachers... They remind people how lost they are if they don't get their lives right with God. You know, one of my favorite preacher stories ever is about an old pioneer preacher by the name of Peter Cartwright. Uh, he was a guy that just kind of built this reputation for telling it how it was. I mean, truth is truth, and he didn't care how it hit you. He just got it out there. Well, he was preaching one time close to Washington, D.C., and the congregation he was at got word that president... Andrew Jackson was going to be in attendance on Sunday. And so the men of that group quickly called Peter Cartwright aside and said, listen, listen, listen. You got to guard your remarks. <laughs> we, we know you say it like it is, but, but we can't have you offending the president of the United States. And so Sunday came and the president was sitting in their attendance. And Peter climbed into the pulpit and he said, like literally first words out of his mouth. I understand that President of the United States, Andrew Jackson, is with us this morning. I have been asked to guard my remarks. Andrew Jackson will go to hell if he does not repent. And of course, everyone was as uncomfortable as you could possibly imagine. Actually makes me uncomfortable to read it. But Andrew Jackson caught his hand while leaving that day and said, Sir, if I had a regiment of men like you, I could whip this world. Listen, if we want revival, then there are times when the comforter has to become the afflictor, when the minister must become the disturber. We've got to listen and respond to some of the harder things. In fact, I'll make a point because Paul says this to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he, he's telling the young man, preach the word, be prepared in season and out of season. And I want you to notice that there are three kinds of preaching that Paul says are needed. He says, correct, rebuke, and encourage. And I just ask you, which one do you think is most popular? But he goes on to say, with great patience and careful instruction, for the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they want to suit their own desires. They will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Look, the issue is not if men can still preach like Elijah. The issue is if anyone will let them. You know, the fire that used to burn in a lot of hearts of many preachers have been put out by churches who would just rather do a dance. But Elijah was not going to let the fire in his heart be extinguished. He said, you pick a bull and I get the other one. Now, you, you say that Baal is the God who sends rain and sun and harvest. You say Baal is the reason for fertility in your world. Well, starting a fire can't be that hard for him. And so keep reading in chapter 18, starting at verse 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first, since there are many of you. I mean, he starts very thick with sarcasm from the very beginning. Look, there's so many of you. You can get this done really quickly. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. And so they took the bull given them and prepared it. And they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Oh, Baal, answer us, they shouted. But there was no response. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah began to taunt them. I just, it's interesting to me 
as much as he's been a wanted man for a long time, he has no problem putting himself in a more dangerous position by egging them on. Shout louder, he said. Surely he is God. Perhaps he's in deep thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping or must be awakened. And I, I can't read that without giving you a little information about these taunts. It reads fairly innocent. But the truth is, when he says your God's preoccupied, what Elijah is saying to them in their language is perhaps he's indisposed. Your God's using a restroom is his idea. And so verse 28, they shouted louder and they slashed themselves with swords and spears as was their custom until blood flowed. Midday passed and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one Paid attention. Now, Elijah is not just after a personal win here. And you got to understand this. He wants to expose the foolishness of Baal worship forever. And he didn't guard his comments. He said whatever it took. See, Elijah is determined to declare the impotence of false religion once and for all. There is truth and there is untruth. And a revival preacher is not afraid to simply tell the simple truth to the people. See, Elijah's focused on these guys. They're dancing, they're cutting, they're bleeding, they're screaming. And then he looks to the people. This is who you choose to worship? You give your money, your crops, your children to these guys? They're lunatics. It was a classic picture of how low men sink when they've truly left God. Now, listen, tolerance might be a great virtue in America, but it is not a revival virtue. I just point this out. In verse 30, Elijah sets out to repair the altar of the Lord. And it's, it's pointed as well. He says, take 12 stones. These 12 stones are to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. This, this again, is a slap in Ahab's face because he only rules 10 of them. God wants the whole thing. And so he takes the 12 stones and he sets them up. And then he rebuilds the altar. And notice, we have to remember, they've had no rain for three and a half years. I mean, it's as dry as you can possibly imagine. And he says, now you bring me four big pots of water and just douse the altar. And they do. And then he says, you do it again. And so they do it again. He said, I want you to do it one more time. And they do it again. Water is dripping everywhere. The trench around the altar is filled with it. Notice verse 36. At the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, O Lord, answer me. And I just point out, this is what revival is. So that these people will know that you, O Lord, are God and that you are turning their hearts back to you. See, at this point, God breaks in. He doesn't wait to be asked to bring fire. He doesn't even wait for the amen of Elijah's sermon or prayer. He just sends fire from heaven. I mean, it just comes raining down and consumes it all. And when you see something like that, you do what these people did. They fall flat on their faces. And they start shouting aloud, the Lord is God. Yahweh is God. Jehovah is God. You see, there was a flame rekindled in their hearts. But Elijah understood that if this revival was going to last for any amount of time, something still needed to happen. And so reading on in verse 40, Elijah commanded them, seize the prophets of Baal, don't let anyone get away. And they seized them. And Elijah had them brought down to the Kishon Valley and slaughtered there. Now, I'll give you your third challenge. You see, revival takes not only powerful praying and pointed preaching, but revival fire calls for demanding orders. In fact, I'll put it to you this way. It calls for potent prescriptions. If I want revival, then I must be prepared for God to tell me some things that are hard to do. Things that are difficult for me. You think when you read this story, Elijah got a little bit cruel? <laughs> you, you, do you think he had to go that far? I mean, did all those prophets actually have to be slaughtered? Did it have to be so extreme? Now, now listen, church. 
obeying the word of God is always extreme. It's heavenly orders for earthly beings. It's going to be extreme no matter how you go about it. In fact, Exodus 22, 20 tells us this, whoever sacrifices to any God other than the Lord must be destroyed. Well, that's the thought. Look, it can be extreme to obey God's word, but revival fire depends on it. It depends on getting rid of all those things that displease God, even when that's hard medicine to swallow. Let me just ask you, would you thank a surgeon that only wanted to remove some of your cancer? Would you say, ah, just thanks for not being so cruel and so extreme? There was a cancer in Israel, and they had to get radical about getting rid of it. And Elijah was ready for that. See, nothing can extinguish revival fire like a cold unwillingness to put to death what displeases God. We got to burn the ships. <laughs> We've got to move forward with no possibility of retreat. So how do you even go about lighting a fire like that? You know, that's a good question. And I would just say for all listening this morning, if you feel like you're going through the motions in your Christianity, if you feel stuck or in a rut, how can you relight that fire? Well, it just might be that revival fire is waiting for us. To make the decision to burn. To put to death everything holding us apart from God. You know, if I went home in a bit and burnt every movie, all the music, all the entertainment, all the books that are a disgrace to God in my life. How high would that flame be? <laughs> I've worked for years with those suffering with addictions. And if those denying a drinking problem were to throw away every bottle. How fire, how high would that fire burn? How high would the flame be? See, Jesus is asking us to put to death some of the language that we use and the jokes that we tell. He wants to destroy some of our habits and all of the selfishness. It has to go into the fire. The greed, the malice, the resentment, all the sin we cherish has to die in the fire. You see, sometimes we have to set a fire. Before God sends fire from heaven. In fact, I'll show you one place in the New Testament where this is very clear. It happened in Ephesus. In Acts 19 to verse 18, it says, Many of those who believe now came and openly confessed their evil deeds. I just want you to know, that'd be an uncomfortable scene. They were saying out loud, these things are disgrace to God. These things don't honor God. We want God more than any of these things. And though they're worth something physically, our spirit is worth more. And so here's what they did. A number who practiced sorcery brought all their scrolls together and burnt them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. In this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. I'll just tell you this. I've loved this series. It's been a challenge to me. But the world is not set on fire by Christians that just look nice and act nice and pretend like it's all okay. It is the committed to God who can recognize this must change. I must change. God, light a fire in me. That's what changes the world. We see it in the book of Acts, and we can do it today. Don't be afraid of all in commitment, because that's just where this starts. It starts with giving everything to God. Revival broke out in Ephesus because people were willing to set a fire to all those things that displeased God. Now, I want to give just a really brief conclusion this morning to the lesson in the whole series, really. The question for us is not whether fire still falls from heaven. The question is, do we desire to be on fire? God is able. Are we willing? And I'll just, from this particular text, bring out two challenges that Elijah brings to me today, and I think he's bringing to all of us as we've listened. And the first challenge for us is this. We've got to stop doing this dance. Stop limping between two choices. Stop thinking that we can serve God and whatever else we've got on the side. You see, it's so easy to be noncommittal when our culture has us outnumbered, just like Israel. Society pressures us to do this dance between two commitments. We need to ask God to deliver us from this double-mindedness. 
Look, I, I, I want to leave you with a verse with this challenge that you can pray on and pray over this week. It comes from Psalm 86 at verse 11, and this is it. Just repeat this every day. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. Would you pray that this week? Lord, please, please give me that undivided heart. I, I don't, I no longer want to be tempted to do this dance. I want a heart that not only stops doing the dance, but starts telling people why. Which leads to the second thing I think Elijah challenges me with this morning, and it's this. We need to voice our choice. We have to make our allegiance absolutely clear. Just saying nothing is not Christianity. And that's what God's calling us to do. To be the person that starts the fire because we want to voice the choice of the one true God. See, God would like to make room in my heart to start a fire today. And he would like to set us on fire so that he can use us to start a fire in this land. Like I just again would settle on this thought. The question is not, where is the God of Elijah? The question for us is, where are the Elijahs of God? He was a man like us that prayed the promises of God, would not tolerate the things in his life that separated from God, and God sent fire from heaven. And I love the thought with Elijah. If we're willing to prepare the altar and get on, God will light the fire. So this morning, do you want to blaze or do you want to dance? You've got a choice to make. I thank you for your kind attention. And I pray God blesses you as you seek him and seek revival in your life.